One of the key leaders in the times of the Old Testament was Moses. It's the one everyone knows about, Moses, right? And so when we find Moses at the beginning of when he is called to be a leader, he is hesitant and stumbling. He's not sure of his words. He needs a staff to lean on and a brother to speak for him. But then he follows. He follows God's call, and he leads the people. And by the time we find him at the end of his life, he has stood up the Pharaoh, he has led the people through the waters of the Sea of Reeds. He has led them into the wilderness, taught them the gift of Torah, God's teaching. And he has helped an entire generation of the Jewish people to know what it means to follow God and to be faithful. And so just as they are ready to enter the promised land across the river Jordan, he up and dies. Funny how that happens. He's been around for quite a while, but he dies. And so what happens next? The people are confused. Who will lead us? Well, there's this Joshua fellow, and so they have this Joshua fellow. He's young. He's not, uh, he hasn't been doing it for a while. He hasn't led them before. They're not comfortable with him. He doesn't have the experience that Moses has, and they have to wonder, is Joshua going to be up to the challenge? Well, the people set out for the promised land, and they come to the River Jordan, and the River Jordan parts before them, and I think it's important to remember how important this moment is, for when do you know that when do the Hebrew people know that they've gotten away from Pharaoh? When Moses is leading them, have they gotten away from Pharaoh when he says you can go? No, no. They've left the country. Are they still, are they safe yet? Nope. Because then Pharaoh sends out his army, the ancient equivalent of tanks. He sends out the chariots and the, the infantry to chase them down. It's when, the, when Moses leads the people and the waters part and they go through the Red Sea, the, the Sea of Reeds, and they get, emerge on the other side. That's when Miriam sings her song. That's when everyone does a little jig of we're free, we're free. Right? So after they come through the other side, that's when they're free. And they come to the River Jordan under Joshua's leadership. And when, when have they really got to the Promised Land? It's when they come out on the other side of the River Jordan. It's when they have gone through the waters and they emerge on the other side and they know indeed that Joshua will be the leader who leads them where they need to go. And now they are the Jewish people in the Promised Land. If Moses is the leader that everyone knows about in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the leader everyone knows about is Jesus. Jesus gathers people to form them into a way of living, a way of life, a way of a community. The word for what he does, he gathers people into an ecclesia, which is a gathering uh, of folk. And uh, for, for some reason, I don't understand how this works, ecclesia in Greek translates into kirk in, in German, and then kirk becomes church in, in English. So that's this idea of gathering, gathering around what Jesus teaches. See, that's what he charges people to do. Go forth now, baptizing people and teaching them to, to do what I've done told you. What have you been doing like me? Now you go forth and teach others to do as well. And they're getting ready to do this, and then Jesus, he up and leaves too. The whole ascension thing, right? He goes away, and, and the disciples are looking around. Well, what's next? Who's going to lead us now? They look at Peter. You? Okay. And Peter leads them. Peter, the one who had forsaken Christ three times, and then Jesus had given him the opportunity to confess his commitment to, to Jesus three times. Yes, Jesus, I love you, I will feed my sheep. Three times he says this. And it, he becomes the right leader for the moment, because having been forgiven, he will forgive others. And if you think about what it was like in that first century, there isn't anyone raised in the church yet because they're starting it. Everyone who joins the church is joining the church for the first time and needs to start a new life. And coming to Peter, Peter knows what it means to start a new life. And so he is welcoming people in who, <coughs> who need to start over again. And he leads the church in, in one of the most important decisions ever made in church. It's in Acts 15. The, the, the decision goes like this. Do you have to get your life in order before you follow Jesus, or you can start at any time? And they decide, you can start following Jesus at any time. You don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to do anything. You just, you just start following Jesus, and you'll be good. And that is the, the rock upon which Jesus builds his church. That's what Jesus says of Peter. You are the rock upon which I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not succeed against it. There are many such transitions in Scripture from one leader to the next. There's always another leader being called. There's always another leader responding. 
Sometimes the transitions go smoothly from Elijah to the confusingly named successor Elisha. Elijah takes the mantle, the, the stole of his, the mark of his service, and he, he hands it to Elisha, and he continues on. And that's a easy. Well, it's not easy. No transition is easy, but it's a smooth transition. Other transitions are not so smooth. The transition from the first king of Israel, Saul, to the second king of Israel, David. Well, that didn't go so well. It worked out in the long run, but ooh, that was ugh, not good. The smoothness of the transition depends upon the people involved. How willing are they to commit to doing it well? I can tell you that I have done everything in my power to set up Josh for success. Josh, will, Pastor Josh will be the fellow who follows me here. I've done everything in my power to, to help him. And uh, he is doing everything he can to make this work. I was down at annual conference and we spent a goodly chunk of time so I could teach him how to put together media shout and we could go over worship together and we were looking at worship and, and he likes how we do worship here and, and he likes having communion as often as possible. So I, I think that'll work really well. I like having communion as often. Communion today. Why? Because I want it. And communion as often as possible. So I, I think that... Uh, Things will go well uh, for this transition. We're both trying to make this work well. Now, as I look uh, at, at this transition that's coming for me, I admit that uh, I don't know what I'm getting into. I was talking to the chair of the board down, down in Shelbina, and they have to reschedule their board meeting. And I was gonna, about to open my calendar so I could look at it to tell her when I was available. I have nothing on the books. Nothing. I can't tell you the last. It's been years since I could say that, right? I have, you just schedule it and I'll be there because I don't have a clue what I'm getting into. And so as the future to me is this one big old blank, oh, I can, what I got right now is I can look at the past. And I look at these past seven years, I look at the book studies we've had together, the kids club programs, how much spaghetti have we served. I think we're approaching a ton of pork given away. Farmer's market, the coffee, the, the music. We've had some really good times. And I'm very thankful for all the times we have shared together. I'm thankful uh, for the itinerant system. The itinerant system is the fancy word for how the Methodist Church takes pastors, people who are willing to serve, and, and people who are willing to serve and matches their skills and gifts and graces with the needs of the church. It was this itinerant system, this way of sending pastor, that brought myself and Olivia to Milan. And I'm very glad it did. When I was told I was going to Milan, I didn't know where it was on a map. I had to go look it up. And now that I'm leaving Milan, I'll never need a map here again. There's nowhere I would rather have been as Olivia and I began our family. It is the same itinerant system that is sending me to Shelbina and Honeywell, and Olivia and I believing that God was in us coming here. We believe that God is in us going there, and we believe that as God guides Josh here, that he will be a blessing to you, and you will be a blessing to him. Now you have to be wondering, will Josh be a good fit? Admit it, are you wondering that? Mm-hmm. That's all well and good, Andy, talk about Joshua following Moses and Peter following Jesus. But let's talk turkey. Is Josh, Pastor Josh Ritzheimer, is he going to fit in here? Let me tell you something. I went to seminary because I had a degree in biology. And my hands were bad. I wasn't going to go into lab work. I spent an entire summer doing research on Limnaea stagnalis, sea slugs. Not only was it boring, I was really bad at it. And so uh, I go back and I'm working on my biology degree and uh, I'm not gonna be a doctor because my bedside manner would be horrible. This is gonna hurt, suck it up. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it? Uh, and so I went to seminary because I love to study scripture. I did not go to seminary because I wanted to be a pastor and, it, cause, and here's why. I, uh, my understanding was I was a square peg. I had my rough edges still do. And I was a square peg, and to be a pastor, I would need to squeeze down into a little round hole, a nice rounded hole of a, a respectable Midwestern Methodist pastor who got along with everyone and didn't have any weird quirks like an odd fixation on knives. I was a square peg, and I didn't know how I was going to squeeze down into that round hole. And I realized at some point that I'm a square peg, 
And I'm not a square peg that has to squeeze down into a round hole. I'm a square peg that has to grow to fill a hole that is as big as I can conceive. Because to be in ministry is not to squeeze down into a little, a little a circular hole. It's to jump into ministry following Jesus. And there is so much opportunity and need and things you can do in the name of Jesus. There are so many people out there to serve and to help and to love. It's jumping into a hole. And my job is to jump into that hole and to invite you all to jump in with me. Right? I'm not a square peg that needs to get into a little round hole. I'm a square peg jumping into something big. And you're going to come with me, and it's going to be good, right? That's what ministry is. Now, I jumped into it with you, and man, we got in some glorious fun together and trouble at times. And Josh is going to come, and he's going to do the same. Is he going to fill his little portion of this big hole in quite the same way? Of course not. That's okay. There's always room for one more when it comes to following Jesus. I'm just bummed I don't get to see how it works out. I'm, I, I, you are going to do well with Josh. I just don't know what it's going to look like yet. Neither do you. And we're nervous. But that's okay. Because we'll get through it. That is where we go next. I'm going to go do the same thing in Shelbina. And I want to leave you in my last sermon here, my last Sunday, by turning to where we're heading. Because we jump into this big thing called ministry together, service to others in the name of Jesus, and we're going somewhere. And where we're going is laid out in Revelation, as it describes the new Jerusalem and the Garden of Eden growing in the midst of it, the tree of life with the leaves for the healing of the nations, the, the feast that we gather around with Jesus at the right hand of the Father and all of us gathered at this feast with all the saints who have gone before us. Every time we gather in the name of Jesus as, as a church, every time we make this dive into ministry and the service to others, we are practicing being in the kingdom of heaven. We are taking one more step towards the kingdom of heaven. And that's where we're headed. That's where all the saints will be joined together again. And so I look forward to the future with confidence. I look forward to the future with confidence in Jesus Christ who will continue to empower and guide his church, including this church. I look forward to the future with confidence in Josh who comes to lead you. And I look forward to the future with confidence in each of you. That each of you will continue to grow into the very likeness of Jesus Christ in your lives. That you will grow to fill this massive thing called ministry. Each of you will grow into the image, more fully into the image of Jesus Christ. And in doing so, you will bring a smile upon the face of the one who made us. Thanks be to God. Amen.